Hey guys, thank you for coming. I've got a real quick question because we seem to have a linguistically rich audience, or at least potentially. Have, does anybody here speak a bunch of languages, like say five or more languages? We have a few hands. Raise your hands, raise your hands. Say six. Keep them up if you still do. I see somebody back there. I see anybody else? Say seven. Still have a hand up here. Anybody else over here? Seven? Is that right? What languages do you speak? I'm curious. Let's come over here. I want to hear. I'm curious. What's your name? Uh, my name is Noor. I am from the north part of Pakistan. I was born there. Uh, so there are different languages, small languages, like five languages which are speak, uh, spoken by a very small population. I can speak all of them. And then I can speak Hindi, I can speak Urdu, I can speak English, I can, I understand Persian, I can read and uh, write in Arabic, so. All right, way to go, Noor. So I have actually studied five languages in my life and I can speak passably one of them. You might guess which one that is. And uh, yeah, I studied Hindi, I studied Sanskrit. Malayalam is my family's mother tongue. I'm just lousy at all of them. And English passable, like, you know, <laughs> unless you ask my editor. But, you know, and yet I still do love just like the poetry and the musicality of different languages and walking by, you know, someone in the streets that surround us and trying to figure out what I just heard. Um, and just relishing in that. And there are apparently, and this is according to the Endangered Language Alliance, who's put on, helped us really bring this event together. There are something like 631 languages, but it also depends on which day, and that's just in New York City, by the way, okay? 631, although it depends on which day you ask them, because whenever I speak to Daniel Kaufman, who you're gonna meet in, uh, in a bit, he'll be like, oh, actually, no, today is 632. And a few days later, literally, he's like, oh, no, actually, it's 637. And I'm like, could you make up your mind? But this is like, apparently, something that's happening. And so we owe them a great service for just like helping us make sense of the fertility of this city and also helping us showcase the amazing speakers who are gonna be on the stage tonight. Um, because we figured we'd showcase them, get a sense of the sound, and also just kind of like make it a little more performative. We don't wanna make this kind of like, you know, a dry exercise in learning new languages. These are languages that are pleasurable in their own right. And so we're gonna have song, we're gonna have storytelling, um, and we're gonna have a little language lesson here and there, and hopefully it's gonna be a whole lot of fun. And so, let's get going. Let's bring out um, the co-director of the Endangered Language Alliance, or the ELA. Please welcome Ross Perlin. <laughs> Ross Perlin. Thanks, Arun. All right. So Ross, you have been doing this for a while now. Um, are you, um, do you speak a bunch of languages? I'm a big language nerd. I love learning languages, but at any given time, I'm lucky if three are still like going strong in my head. One tends to push out another, but I tried to find like one of the few jobs in the world where learning languages was actually, could be a big part of my daily life. Mm -hmm. And so something we can kind of announce right here is that you have something that's, it is hot off the press, something that ELA has done, and you're gonna kind of like take us through that right now, right? This is basically the debut of our New York City language map, which um, is kind of a first ever attempt to actually um, create a, a language map of the most lingu linguistically diverse city, not just in the world, but in the history of the world. Um, this gives a little of kind of snapshot of it. Yeah, as best we can know. I mean, we don't really know what Babel was like in its, in its heyday, oh. but... Uh, <laughs> uh, Didn't turn out so well, though, did it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, we have towers here that we've been building as well, but um, uh, this is just one kind of piece of, of this language map, which you can also see out in the lobby in a kind of blown up version, and it's a beautiful kind of print edition as well. We're working on a digital version uh, as well. And uh, it's just an attempt to kind of catch language, which is so hard. Language flows, it moves in the mouths of its speakers, it moves as speakers move around. I mean, you can't pin it down to a map, but we've tried just to kind of uh, go well beyond the census, which you know f doesn't really capture language and shows actually fewer than 200 languages for yeah, New York. Yeah, that's crazy. I mean, I'm trying to make sense of this. 200, which is something we would often say, if you lived in the city long enough, you'd say something like, oh, they speak something like 180, 160, 200 languages. And then to see this crazy number that you guys have is kind of mind-blowing. Everyone knows that New York is diverse, Queens is diverse, 
Uh, Jackson Heights is the most linguistically diverse you know, zip code or neighborhood in the world. My home. Uh, mm -hmm. But the sort of deeper level of diversity beyond the, the sort of the big national languages. I mean, the, the endangered languages, the indigenous languages, the minority languages that nobody's ever heard of, that are traditionally oral, that are not written, uh, that have fewer and fewer speakers. Uh, those are increasingly a part of New York as well, uh, and we wanted to sort of bring those out. I mean, the map, obviously, we could just sort of paint, you know, English, Spanish, Chinese, Bangla, uh, all over it, but the point was to really bring out the smaller languages and show ones that even have just a few speakers uh, and that don't appear on any census, but that represent communities that we've worked with at the Endangered Language Alliance. So t let's take me through some of the communities that you yourself have, I guess, traveled to a lot on this map. What are some that, that you're really excited to share? Well, since you're a Jackson Heights person, and Jackson Heights has, it has, is a bias. has, the, has the fame, is kind of We classic. are the kings. Uh, I mean, it's an amazing story how yeah. a neighborhood that, that actually, you know, in its early heyday had kind of um, racist covenants that were really designed to keep it a, a whites-only neighborhood, especially to kind of prevent blacks and Jews from living there. Uh, has now become like a, a world capital of hyper diversity. Um, I think New Yorkers, you know, who are familiar with it, might think, oh, it's it's an Indian neighborhood, or it's a, you know, it's a it's an Urdu speaking, maybe. or it's yeah. Colombian. I mean, there's a South Asian part and there's a Latino part, something like that. Uh, but as this kind of zoomed in section shows, yes, there are these you know, these, these, these big national languages there, and we've shown some of them, and we're trying to show the languages in their writing system as well, or as the speakers call the language, you know, but what, what the name they actually use. Um, but you also have, you know, massive Himalayan diversity, for instance. We're going to get a little taste of that tonight from mm -hmm. Rasmina, a speaker of a language called Seke, which is spoken in five villages of Nepal uh, and in Brooklyn and Queens, um, with kind of, you know... It just goes on and on. I mean, just about every language, every Himalayan language of Nepal, which you know is a country that has over 140 languages, is represented in, in within a square mile of Jackson Heights. Which is crazy because it's it's a relatively, it's not a large country. But when you look at Nepal, there's an incredible diversity within that country that rivals many much larger countries. Diversity has to do with you know geography, history. Uh, the intentions of, of peoples who maintain their languages and cultures where they are. Uh, you know, Nepal is a, is, is a case where just, you know, the, the sheer kind of diversity of the landscape and the, and the particular history of the country have, have given it this kind of, uh, uh, this, this deep linguistic diversity that, um, you know, is increasingly endangered. A lot, of, a lot of the languages that we're showing here and that we're talking about are not being passed on to children as much or have very small numbers of speakers. I mean, the whole kind of environment for maintaining small languages has, has changed the whole equation. Uh, but, um, but at the same time, you know, I think that there are a, a huge number of people who are trying to do things to kind of keep these languages up. So when you in your research go into, say, a neighborhood like Jackson Heights or any other neighborhood, you're not necessarily going to hear these languages on the streets, right? Some of these neighbor uh, languages are just spoken behind closed doors, I imagine. And you're not going to see it on the linguistic signage because as I mentioned, you know, you will see, you know, you'll see signs in Burmese and in Bangla and there's, you know, you'll see a pharmacy on Roosevelt Avenue that says pharmacy in six languages and that's pretty cool also. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but to get to the sort of like the hundred languages that, you know, that, 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 we're, that we're seeing here, representing here, you kind of have to know, you have to get to know a community and you have to know what to listen for and you have to have a sense of, uh, of the linguistic geography of the home country as well, and the sort of fluid dynamics of migration, how people have moved from what villages. Uh, and, you know, people, th there's also a history of people feeling shame about their languages. They've been made to feel that they don't speak well because they don't speak some kind of national prestige language. Mm -hmm. uh, and so they may be reluctant, this is one of the issues with the census, to, to come right out and say, oh, I'm a speaker of, 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 of Seke or, or, or Loke, these are two of the languages, for instance. Um, you know, they might just say, I'm a speaker of Nepali, which is the national language, or I'm a speaker of Tibetan, which is a kind of a prestige language. Uh, and so it's a matter of, you know, really working closely with those communities, understanding, you know, who they are and where they're coming from. Uh, and then you have to really get into the language and look at the language, which is part of the work that we do, which, you know, has to do with uh, building a dictionary and, and doing recordings of stories and narratives and texts, uh, analyzing the grammar and understanding how the grammar works. I mean, mm -hmm. that's how you actually understand what people are speaking and, mm -hmm. and how. Mm -hmm. So let's look at, I want to look at this map while it's up. So you have, well, why don't you take us through some of these names that some people, we, most of us have probably never heard of some of these words before. Yeah, so I mean, you have kind languages. of to the left, you have uh, the the name in the language as people call it as much as possible uh, in the writing system if there is one. Then to the to the right in parentheses, you have the English name, and you know what you see are kind of 
uh, clusters and, and microcosms. You know, so to, to, the, to the south, you see kind of the, the Indonesian world uh, of, of, of Jackson Heights, um, which you is- mean, Are you talking about the south part? South part of Jackson, Jackson Heights. Jackson Heights. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you see things like, you know, Basa Jawa, Javanese, and uh, Balinese, and Tontemboan, you're, you're, you're seeing here kind of the languages of Indonesia that are represented, and there's a sort of a cluster there, or there's kind of like a, this is getting down a little more into Woodside, mm -hmm. uh, or Woodside Road, that mm -hmm. area. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, the languages of that kind of Thai cluster, that's mm -hmm. sort of the principal sort of Thai and Southeast Asian neighborhood getting you know, between Woodside and, and Elmhurst. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, if you look to the sort of uh, northeast of that bubble, there's a group of languages which are from a particular region of Bangladesh. I mean, there are lots and lots of speakers of Bangla or Bengali in the city, of course, uh, but, but Bangladesh is also a linguistically diverse country with other languages as well, and so a handful of speakers of languages like Chak and Chakma and Tripuri, mm -hmm. which are from uh, uh, what's known as the Chittagong Hill Tract mm -hmm. area of, of Bangladesh, so an area of Bangladesh that's kind of, uh, you know, sort of to the east and pointing more towards Myanmar, uh, and those, and, and we also kind of are interested in looking at, you know, what, it, what is the, the sort of the genealogy and the roots of these languages. In the case of those languages, they belong to the Tibeto-Burman family of languages. They're actually more related to things like Tibetan and Burmese and the languages of the Himalaya, actually, mm. uh, than they are to, to Bangla, which is an Indo-European language. So real quick, when we look outside of Jackson Heights and we look at, I mean, if you go to, say, Manhattan, we don't necessarily imagine linguistic diversity there in some, but I'm guessing that you're going to say it's otherwise. Yeah, Manhattan has its own kinds of linguistic diversity. Manhattan, after all, is home to the United Nations, mm -hmm. uh, which is Does its that count? own. I think the United Nations counts. It's on the map. You have to count it in some way. I mean, <laughs> the embassies and the consulates are actually amazing places linguistically huh. as well. Uh, it's not just the national languages that are represented in some of them. It's also, you know, what the consular officers and employees of the consulate speak. Um, actually, uh, talking to somebody who was, we kind of uh, collaborated with doing, doing some of this research, she was saying that just the, uh, some of the people working, at, there, there happens to be a large percentage of people from the Philippines working at United Nations consulates, and the Philippines is an incredibly linguistically diverse area. And so just by meeting those people at the various consulates, you have you know, an extraordinary number of languages of the Philippines represented. Mm. Uh, so, um, yeah, it, it's also this whole question of where to locate languages. I mean, Manhattan is the job center, so even if people are living in outer boroughs or elsewhere, they're working in Manhattan. You guys have a slide of Brooklyn, too, don't you? Yeah. Um, I feel like we have to show Brighton Beach here as a kind of... Uh, and also Irish English is like sitting by itself over there. Yeah, Garretson Beach, some of these neighborhoods... Are I, they kind of insular? Uh, <laughs> I should Garrison say that, Beach, you know, yeah. we're, this, this, this map, as Arun mentioned, 637 languages at the kind of latest count, mapped at almost a thousand different sites, so we kind of allowed a, a few languages to be in, in multiple places. And uh, we've included some of what are called ethnolects, things like Irish English. I mean, Irish is also represented here as well in many places, but Irish English as what linguists call an ethnolect. So also, you know, a kind of uh, strongly marked, distinctive kind of variety of a major, you know, kind of macro language like English. Uh, this is different from like um, Gaelic or something like that. Yeah, so that would be Totally Irish, different. Irish, Gaelic, Irish. totally different language, but uh, but also showing some of these really significant kind of ethnolects that uh, uh, that really are the major languages of communities. I Irish has become a highly endangered language, actually, even though it's the national, you know, a national language in in Ireland. So you have Uyghur down beneath. What does it say? Is it say Bontoc? Uh Yeah, the case of Bontoc is an interesting one. So just to give a basic uh, a kind of an overview of, of Brighton Beach, again, it's a case like. Jackson Heights, where people might think, okay, it's an Indian neighborhood. Or Russian. Uh, Brighton Beach, people might think it's a Russian neighborhood. Uh, but really, at this point, it's almost kind of in microcosm, like the whole of the former Soviet Union, kind mm. of recombined and represented. <laughs> like, uh, <laughs> so it's extraordinary, I mean, a place to hear not just Russian, of course, as a lingua franca, which connects these communities, but also other Eastern European languages, Central Asian languages, Caucasian languages, all of these. Uh, Bontoc is a, is a particularly interesting one, and we have an asterisk next to it because um, uh, we're showing some historical languages actually on the map as well. We're not going deep into the history, but they are, we are representing in a few cases. And Bontoc is there in Coney Island because it was actually a, a village of people from the Philippines who at one point uh, and it's, 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 it's a dark history, it's a strange history, but it's the history, uh, were brought as a kind of amusement uh, to Coney Island 100 years ago. Wow. Uh, and there's a book about this as well, very interesting. 100 years uh, ago. To kind of 
rebuild that village in Coney Island as an Is there any connection to like US imperialism in that story? Yeah, I mean, that was exactly the time, and this is right after that kind of multi-year war where the US put down, you know, the US was controlling the Philippines. The Philippines were an American colony at the time, and the US was putting down that kind of uh, insurgency in the Philippines. Wow, amazing. So let's move on real quick before we have to move on. Um, I, I just, you know, we have to kind of show one of the newest and most extraordinary kind of realms of linguistic wow. diversity in New York, which is West African Harlem and the Bronx. Uh, again, you know, there you might, of course, you'll, you'll, you know, you'll know about Harlem as a, you know, major site of, of African America, African American culture, but it's also become you know, in the, in the whole hemisphere, kind of the major site for, for African languages as well, and now oh. increasingly the Bronx, too. Uh, so this is just a little, a little portrait of that. Um, Which of those, if you could just go back to that, yeah. are like, you know, I guess on the more prominent edge uh, of these languages in terms of well-represented? In terms of larger languages, that yeah, are, yeah. So we, we're using size to kind of show some of the. I mean, there's so many things going on like linguistically in the community. Wolof would be, you know, very prominent. Okay, on 116th Street, right? Yeah. Little Senegal. Uh, it's the you know the major national language of, of of Senegal. There are other smaller Senegalese languages as well. Um, you know, another interesting thing that's in here is, uh, you know, that, that there's the sort of francophone world in Africa. There's the anglophone world in Africa, and that also kind of structures a little bit how this is, uh, you know, how this is, how, how, where people live. There's the world of people who speak Arabic mm -hmm. from Africa as mm -hmm. well. Uh, and then there are also these kind of large clusters, and we're going we're gonna to hear a little later from Keule and Salu, our, our wonderful musicians who are from this kind of wider Mande culture, uh, which is, you know, kind of represents the, uh, the Mali Empire, uh, which existed from approximately the 13th to the 17th centuries and has many kind of languages within it and connected, kind of the way that Latin was kind of the language of the Roman Empire and sort of split off into many other languages. Similar thing happens in West Africa with the Mali Empire and the Mande languages. And now they're kind of all coming back together and meeting each other in Harlem and the Bronx. Wow. All right, well, we're gonna hear more from Ross in a few minutes. Ross, thank you so much. Thanks, Arun. <laughs> all right, so now we're gonna bring out our, um, our first language speaker. Uh, her name is Husnia Khujamirova, and she is just one of a dozen speakers of the language of Wahi. So, Husnia, why don't you come on out? Originally from Tajikistan. Um, Tajikistan is uh, located in Central Asia and it is one of the post Soviet countries. Um, I was uh, born and raised in the Pamir region and I speak uh, almost all the Pamir languages, which are Wahi, Shugni, Roshani, Bartangi, and uh, Ishkashimi, uh, that uh, I spoke in my family, uh, Shugni and Wahi. But when I went to school, um, you know, I learned Tajik, which is the uh, national language of the country. And then I did uh, my bachelor in linguistic, uh, which was all a subject, subject in uh, Russian. And uh, obviously I moved to the United States and I did my master's in education in English, which is universal language. Um, uh, Premier languages, um, you know, uh, they belong to Eastern Iranian um, language family, and today they are extremely endangered because um, they, you know, they were never documented or um, written in the past. So, uh, Wahi language is uh, my mother tongue that I you know uh, my mother taught me Wahi. And today it's spoken not only in Tajikistan, but also in um, uh, Hunza Valley, Pakistan, in um, uh, China, and also in Afghanistan. So um, uh, when I, 2011, I was you know, honored to be part of Endangered Language Alliance and uh, uh, joined them to uh, d develop and uh, you know, to uh, document endangered languages, especially my mother tongue and other endangered languages of my country. So this picture was taken last year. We um, went to Tajikistan uh, with my colleague, uh, Nicole and Ross. So we were able to um, document, you know, um, 
native speakers and we went to a small uh, village which is called uh, Rin and the language is uh, Ishkashimi and I feel like it's the most endangered language compared to all other um, uh, Pamiri languages. And uh, also uh, our purpose today and my aim is um, as a linguist to try um, to you know, preserve those endangered languages and create um, different materials for children, especially a children's book. And um, you know, that um, the one of the reason why the languages are dying is because people are moving you know, for living different countries such as Russia, US or Canada or other parts of the world. And there's no uh, enough materials for them to teach their children to pass the language. Um, so I feel like it's so important for each individual to, you know, to, to know the language, to know your mother tongue and pass it to your uh, children. So um, when I you know I was, I've been trying to um, collect different children's uh, stories for children and um, I decided and I chose one uh, uh, interesting story for you guys and I am going to um, tell the story in Wahi language and I want you to um, uh, based on the illustration if you can guess what is actually the story about <laughs> yeah that will be a test <laughs> yeah. um. Я почув на цих шуйх шуйдах твит. Я почув хам уз эч вахт хедерди райер не рандер. Неки узел а я халгеранем ки я ум бой гари ти дериоди с мишет ки мне. Неки почув а ти фикер керти ки е трангин хал пидонелос. И руски и рай везде. Я хан ки е почув. Жена де дериоде с бои гарите, жена де озон боя дем кшло, уз хоиш сарем ти дерди јунда. Почо дохтар га хшуи тој кукт хоиш керки ави јунда. Почо буар не цар, ја речен дек човјаки, дитиен ки ја кашан тој ки ја бои гари де дериоде, ја уга бои тој ки дет кшло. Ја почо рози вос, хшуи дерди, ранди ја кашер. Я веш во цинек джоја, кохен туј, афтча во на Рузија вен туј шахест. Бајдеал, ја рузарки, ја почон, ја почо духтарин, ја му визите ашке. Ја ханки ене пес. Тути лохе да е прстија, не ем цкуна ем бојгари пи докер. Цкуна на дем цклаек шлох фат почо, бојте е ти рај. Ја не о, ја хинан ханки. Е, мунџо, ну знаеш што? Кај кој зи лоја прса? Ир узнаг доста ти ахина не хдаи прст. Ханде дай ти он тут срен бој вед кдем кдем кшлок ли бичора. Ја дай бих кендер боариран, ја кендер чизард. Хандки женен ти дем чиз нержхун морги зарин. Ти морги зарин мари ордам крти ки уз ајем тум бој гари, ајем мар чиз женен цей. وزم پیدا کرده. یا خیلی که بیچاره توی دکه ندیش، یا خموم ری نقصه. هنده مامیم رنگ، یا نه مرغ زارین، یا جای بخند که اکنون جای توی دکه. یا کمپیرو شیار تو، یا جای گات، یا نه مرغ زارین دشت خبست خرالت. یا دای بیچاره ویزت خون که یا مرغ زارین است. Հավ ճղամ գին ոս պրստ գիմ չիզ գավ, մեղ ու կումր դու էտք, եա դայնիվ նետիշտ գի ավ ու բետք էտք, եա ու շկուր շկուր դեղ մրխ զարին ինդ է գոտ, եա ու ենք եա գոնա պիշ դու էտք, եա պիշեր գյորդանցար Ја зеа хусоиве. Ја ја морги зарини ке хусоиве рузем, ја дај во стхиш, ја кампи, ја хинан хан дуз патичко и реди, ја не хане. А тоа вакт е дај, ти е ткенде, морги зарини, ти е пиш, ја кџојах, швахта на зимбекица. 
this was the end of the story. <laughs> So, I would, you know, anybody have any thoughts? What is the story about? Or the language that you heard, what do you think? What did it remind you? Maybe some, maybe some words are similar to any language that you know. Any volunteer? I think the word for chicken was similar, like you were using murki for chicken. Yeah. We say the same in Urdu. Oh, oh, yes, yeah, yeah. Mur. Yeah. Mur, yes. That's uh, what I was thinking. I, I, I sounded like Urdu. Hindi, uh, 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 I think a little bit of Arabic, and maybe, what's, what's Persian, Persian language? Parsi. Parsi, Parsi, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That, that's, yes. There was a lot of Haas. <coughs> there were a lot of words that were similar to Farsi in terms of verbs, especially. So, being and stuff like that, like Haas and things like that. Right, right, yes, yes. Any, anybody else? Yeah, I think that was the Wahi speaker we had, the Wahi speaker, I think so. Yes, no, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm from Tajikistan, he's from Pakistan, but I'm sure he understood it fully, right? Um, yeah, um, so I'm going to tell you the story shortly, what is that about, you know. Um, so there was a king, he had a beautiful daughter, and he wanted to marry, uh, you know, his daughter to anyone who is very rich and also has a golden in the gold and treasure hidden underwater so um and he thought that there's you know this such person does not exist in that small poor uh, village so a guy came and you know told him that i have uh, wealth and you know i want to marry your uh, your daughter so the king didn't believe they went together and then discovered that he really had a treasure hidden underwater so he agreed they got married and they ma made a wedding for seven days and uh, one day, um, the, the, the girl's uh, grandma came and wanted to know how did, you know, uh, her husband got rich. So she, um, and the wife asked her husband one night that, you know, how did you get rich? Well, everybody's poor. And then the, the husband said that, you know, I have a golden hand who helped me to be rich. So, and the lady tells uh, her grandma, you know, the story and the place where the, uh, the uh, golden hand was hidden. So the grandma you know, um, sold it <laughs> and runs, she runs away and then the husband comes and discovers that you know the golden hand is gone and he would he asked his uh, cat to help him and find the hand. So the cat sold it, uh, the grandma and uh, that you know she stole the hand and she again the cat stole the hand from the grandma and brought it back. <laughs> So after that, the husband, the wife, the cat, and the golden hen lived together happily. <laughs> Thank you. So, yeah, I actually, uh, I actually guessed right then. I figured it out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I was pretty sure that was a story. Yeah. That's amazing. Can we please give a hand not only to Husnia, but also to illustrator Clarissa Diaz, who's right there in the front row. She's, uh, our very talented colleague, and Isaac Jones in the back, who scored the music live. Isaac? Yay, yeah, Isaac. All right. Um, so, Husni, you actually kind of only really stepped up your study of Wahi when you moved to New York. Is that right? Yeah, that's true. I mean, it's my mother tongue, but I never looked at it as a like you know real like language, or that one day I'll be really using it, and I, one day I will document my own language and discover a lot of, you know, um, things that I never knew before. And one thing that really struck me when you when we talked in the, um, a couple of weeks ago, you were saying how it's only here um, when you're surrounded by, what, a dozen other Wahi speakers that, and as you're studying the language more intently, uh, that you started reading more fairy tales in Wahi and you even learned the death ceremony, correct? Yeah, that's true. Um, you know, when I moved to the United States and when I joined especially ELA team, that's, that was like I really like sort of like I woke up, you know. I just saw the beauty of the language and also I, it connected me so much to my identity, to my, you know, uh, uh, like traditional, uh, you know, uh, some, some culture things that I never knew before. An example is a, a death ceremony. So I, you know, I left my country at a very early age and I was, I've never attended any death ceremony. 
and I didn't know what is like, you know, the each step that they follow, what is the meaning. So through interviewing people and then, you know, transcribing and translating, so I, I learned the death ceremony and how powerful it is. Mm -hmm. And I guess, is this something that you regularly convene with other people, um, either in person or virtually in terms of trying to keep the language going? Do you chat with friends here or relatives on the phone or on Skype, anything like that? Yeah, I mean, I, I mostly use, uh, you know, those Pamiri languages, or especially Shugni and Wahi with my friends that I communicate. And also uh, in the Wahi language, so there are I think five or six families from Pakistan that we, we communicate in New York. Uh, but rather than that, with my mom mainly, even with my siblings, with my sisters, we mostly speak like English. But my mom is the one that I speak to her pure Wahi. So this is something you think is kind of special about this city that you feel in some ways, I guess, empowered to kind of do this in a way that you might, you've lived in different places, right? It's not just you came straight to New York. Do you feel that there is something about, I guess, the social climate in some ways that makes it easier to do this here? I think, yeah, there's something very special about New York. You know, it's not only compared to other states, but compared to other countries. Because in New York, um, you know, I, even though I'm very far from my country, but there's still some, I can find some Pamiri speakers that I can connect to, you know, or some uh, Wahi speakers, as I said, from Pakistan. They can, you know, uh, we sometimes meet together and, you know, we celebrate any uh, holiday, and then that's the time we, we chat, we communicate in the, in the language. So I feel like that's, you, you know, unique about New York and you sort of, and also like organization, like ELA, right? That does not exist. I mean, I have lived in Turkey or Dubai and other places that does not exist. So we're like here in New York, you know, these, um, through different sort of events, such, you know, this event or any or like other events that we attend, they sort of like make you feel uh, that your language is, you know, appreciated. So you don't like feel like alone. All right, thank you so much, Husnia. Please give a big hand to Husnia for Jamilova. And uh, let's bring back our members of the ELA now. Can we uh, have Ross back in here? And let's also bring the founder of the ELA. Welcome back, Ross. Um, Daniel Kaufman. All right, so we've asked the crowd here, um, do you guys speak a lot of languages yourself? Come on, come on. I speak a few. A few. <laughs> he Two? has several secret languages that he uses just around the office, actually. It makes it hard to work together. <laughs> come on, out with it, Daniel. Uh, Hebrew, Indonesian, Tagalog, um, English, and then smatterings of others. Smatterings of 22 others. <laughs> I think so, yes. Is there, do you have an area that you're especially into? Uh, I would say Austronesian languages, which is the languages of the Pacific and Indonesia and the Philippines. So I spent around four years in the Philippines as an undergraduate focusing on those languages. So I would say that's my specialty. Okay. Just bring the mic a little closer. Sure. You I mean, you so. can just pull, pull, pivot it toward yourself. And how about you, Ross? Um, I sort of, in a parallel way, spent a number of years living in southwest China. Right. Uh, so working through, through Mandarin Chinese, which I was using kind of all the time, but actually focusing on Him Himalayan languages there, so um, several languages there. So how long has the ELA been around? Uh, officially since 2010, and it, it kind of got started earlier in an unofficial form. Uh, it's around 2008, so around 10 years. Did you have sort of some estimate of how many languages existed in the city back then that was considerably different from what it is now? So, well, the official census said something like, at that time, 150 or so, you know, and, and uh, I, I wouldn't have been brave enough to venture a guess. Our co-director, uh, Juliet Blevins, did some mathematics that I still don't fully understand, and, and the next day came out of her office and said, six to 800 languages. And I said, no, that sounds a little crazy, and no, nah, we can't. And she said, no, no, you know, I looked at the countries from which most immigrant communities are coming from and the numbers, and I extrapolated this from that. And it was a number, it was interesting, because it, it got printed in an article, and then you could really see how, how numbers take a life of their own, right? 
all of a sudden New York had six to 800 languages <laughs> after we said that. That became the official st statistic for New York City. But then, uh, you There's know... damn journalist, right? <laughs> <there's>, oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then, you know, after Ross and, and others did the hard work of, of really tracking down uh, all of the languages on this map, it turned out to be correct. So what makes a language endangered? What makes it endangered is if it's being passed down or not. So a language, like for instance, uh, Husnia and, and some of the others you'll hear tonight, they speak languages with uh, several thousands of speakers, 40,000, 50,000 speakers. And you could think that that's a lot of uh, speakers and, and there are languages that have not had that many speakers throughout their whole existence, but things are changing very rapidly. So if a language is not being passed down to children, then that's what makes it endangered, much more so than the absolute number of speakers. So the word itself kind of forces the analogy between languages and species. Um, is that, do you think, an apt analogy to, you know, that a language, um, its existence or rather its potential loss is similar to that of a species from an ecosystem? There's, there's arguments for and against it. Um, it's kind of interesting in that people are documenting languages sometimes uh, with the idea that they, languages can be revived just like in Jurassic Park, you know, they took DNA and they revived a, a dinosaur. And they say, well, if we have enough documentation, then down the line, this, this language can be, can be brought back to life just through all these recordings. Uh, but I think what's really more important, both actually in the cases of species and languages, is to really create the environment for these languages and species to continue living. Uh, much more important, I would say, than trying to you know, rescue uh, a, a string of DNA or, or get enough recordings that maybe in 200 years uh, in the post-apocalyptic world we can, we can revive the language from scratch. So in that, there is an important analogy there, which is what really counts is creating the right environment for these things to be able to continue today. And do we, yeah, what does that mean? I, th I think just to add to that, I, you know, New York City is a very particular kind of environment for languages, and in both in New York and in other cities, you know, in so many cases, the pressures to assimilate and the economic pressures have meant that languages, you know, don't last very long if it's not the majority or dominant language. Uh, and, you know, languages that are coming from very particular environments, you know, a particular mountain valley on the other side of the world or an island in the Pacific, they're coming here. And I think what we're trying to think about is, is ways that New York can be a hospitable and wonderful and welcoming place where actually multilingualism and even smaller languages can really thrive even over the long term. And that's a big challenge. So what are, the, like, what are one or two things that you think we can do to make that possible? One thing, I mean, I think just to sort of set out two kind of avenues of it. One, I think, is very much just in the kind of social, everyday context, what Husnia was talking about, just like this. And I think we're there in some ways, but we could go further. This, this openness and curiosity and interest, this kind of cosmopolitanism, that is just like a popular everyday level and just kind of like bone deep kind of tolerance that you see in, in Queens every day on the streets, not everywhere all the time, but um, just person to person. On another level, we do need to think about you know, public policy and uh, wh what's called language access and making sure that people you know, who are in the, in the courts or in hospitals or you know, whatever it is can actually uh, have some support in their language, which is a really challenging thing to think about when there are so many languages here. What are the three languages that have really successfully come back from, you know, what's the term used? Dormancy, right? Mm -hmm. Like, what are the big success stories of language revival? <laughs> Who this guy? <laughs> is he? Uh, there, there are different kinds of stories, but I'll, maybe I'll give I'll give my my three, and, and sure, sure. you can give your three. <laughs> uh, I mean, there are lots of interesting stories going on, and uh, I think it's you know uh, we're in a kind of golden age of language re revitalization. So these stories are just kind of un unfurling mm -hmm. now. I mean, one amazing case that's ongoing is that of Wampanoag, uh, which was one of the very first languages that. Uh, Puritans, pilgrims kind of encountered in coastal Massachusetts in the 1600s uh, and is now, you know, it really was not being spoken um, kind of into the 19th century. Mm. Uh, but now, based on you know, some good materials that were, that were left, some documentation, um, you know, with leadership from, from an activist called Jessie Little Doe Baird, uh, is, you know, who, who learned the language herself, is from the Wampanoag community and is teaching her own children and, you know, expanding out to her community is really kind of bringing a language back. 
Um, another amazing case is that of, of Hawaiian, which um, you know is a, an Austronesian language uh, from the Pacific, and you know was really being sort of worn down and whittled down uh, as the U.S. kind of came into to Hawaii, but is having a remarkable renaissance on many fronts, especially through a kind of re completely kind of built up education system, ground up built education system, uh, and maybe one third case that's an interesting New York story. Uh, is that of Yiddish, which is um, not an endangered language at this point, uh, but was a much larger language in the past, uh, and uh, you know, in complex ways is being sort of revived and maintained, uh, especially within the Hasidic community in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. So I guess when you have people who are, um, you know, just eight or 10 or 12 people in a city, uh, is it possible to have a relatively small number of speakers and not have it be endangered? I mean, do you see languages that are um, relatively um, small in terms of number of speakers but are still very much being passed on? To some extent, yes. Uh, it it ha really has to do with the ideology to, to some extent of the community. So there are some languages that kind of have, uh, they imbue a kind of uh, institutional confidence, right? Because they're backed by uh, you know, a prestigious history, for instance, right? And so for those languages, I think that even you, though you may have some very small groups of people, they will feel very confident in having, let's say, a no English policy at home, right? And that's something that really counts. If somebody is confident enough to say, we're not going to speak English at home, or we're not going to speak Spanish at home, we're going to speak our uh, heritage language, that makes all the difference. For most people, uh, they don't have that, that, that confidence to, to do that to their children and say, you know, we're going to really uh, stick to our heritage language, in addition, of course, to the languages the children are learning in school. Uh, but you, you occasionally find these individuals that, that do that. They impose a policy, and the results are, are always fantastic, I think, but people are, are scared to do it often. You know? How are we supposed to, if we leave this, um, this space and we start going better, daily lives in New York, and we want to become better at sort of encountering a new language. Are there any tips for doing that? I'm, I'm personally a little bit shameless, and you know, <laughs> we'll go up to someone on the subway very politely and occasionally You'd be say, like, hey. like, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, a lot of people think I'm crazy, but no. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It's, it's, I mean, I think it's tricky, of course. I mean, there are, there, are, there are sensitivities and people, I mean, there are different histories with different communities about how people feel when an outsider kind of asks. Um, I mean, I think we hope that the language map uh, will be a sort of interesting guide for people to, I wouldn't use it to like navigate your way to a party in Brooklyn, but, <laughs> uh, but I do think, you know, you could, you could take a walk. You could take a good walk through the West African Bronx. You could take a walk through you know, indigenous Mexican East Harlem, where you're just sort of aware that um, these languages are there and it might kind of heighten your sense of awareness. And, you know, look at the names on, even if the, 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 the writing, you know, as I said, linguistic signage is not representative of all the oral language diversity, but the names of places, the names of businesses, just listen to what's around you, listen to the sounds, um, try to, you know, learn a little about some of those languages that are in your neighborhood or nearby and kind of, uh, you know, ask ask people, be shameless a little bit, and kind of you know listen to the city. All right. Well, Ross, having said that, I, I should also add. I mean, these are very dark times for for yeah. difference and and diversity, right? So, going to a, a, a random person and asking them what language you speak today can actually be a, a little threatening. Mm. Not when it comes from Ross, of course. <laughs> but, but, oh, Ross. but you know, if, for for me, it's different. You know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, so w ten years ago we sent volunteers to the streets, and we we did have them do that. They just they went around uh, you know Roosevelt Avenue and asked people what languages do you speak, and you know every other person spoke a language that we never heard of before. Uh, but doing that today is uh, we wouldn't do that today. So that's the yeah. thing is like people may really want to share, but they don't know who they can trust exactly. to share it with. Yeah. All right, Daniel and Ross, thank you so much. <laughs> All right, so now we're gonna um, now we're gonna bring up our next language performer, a uh, speaker rather. Um, please uh, welcome Rasmita Guru. <laughs> Hello, this is 
Zach with Yawin. Hello, I just said my name is Rasina Gurum and I'm 21 years old. I am one of the few younger speakers of a language called Seke, which you guys just heard a little bit of. Um, I was born in a town called Tuxan, which is um, in a town called Tuxan in Mustang, which is located in the northern part of Nepal. Um, Tuxan is one of the only four, five villages that where Seke is spoken. The other four are Taile, Gyakar, Tetang, and Tangbe. Um, now, many villagers have moved out of the village in search for better opportunities in places such as Kathmandu, which is the capital, Bokhara, even in America, France, Japan, and etc. Uh, as people are moving, the language is changing with them. Because um, as we say it in Seke, um, which translates to the big fish eats the little fish. In this case, the big fish is the Nepali language. It's the official language of Nepal, so it's spreading very vastly, especially among Seki speakers, because Seki speakers, in the summertime, it gets too hot for them to stay in the city, so they move back to the village. However, in the wintertime, it gets too cold for them to stay in the village, so they move back to the city. Um, there are over 140 languages in Nepal, so Seke, in between them, it gets lost. Um, additionally, people who have settled in the cities raise their families there, so the kids go to school there, and the school over there teaches in Nepali, so the kids get exposed to Nepali a lot more quicker than Seke. Um, I also went to a school where Nepali was taught. However, um, my grandma used to always speak and teach me Seke at home, which is why I was able to keep my Seke alive. I know I'm not the very best speaker of Seke, however, um, it's all a learning process. Um, one of the biggest challenges I faced with Seke was the fact that there was no documentation of it. So thankfully, with the help of ELA, we've been doing some recordings here in New York, as well as back in Nepal, um, recordings of the elders, because the only way to learn Seke before ELA was just through native speakers, just like my grandma. So with the help of ELA, the documentations and the recording, we've been um, archiving them. So in hopes that in the future, the future generation can at least have an idea or a reference of what their native language looks like. Um, there's a saying in um, Seke, Kula zai gotong dimzu. Kula zai gotong skulzu dimye which uh, means that the very first school for children is their home. So whatever is taught at home will be carried forward. Um, I'm very thankful to be able to do this, especially with the documentation and archiving my language, especially for myself and even for my community, because um, me, I'm, by doing this, I'm able to expand my own knowledge in Seke, which is my own native language, and then, um, and then my language is a big part of my culture, and my culture is part of who I am. Um, now I'm going to show you guys a little recipe, a traditional recipe, um, which is very popular among Seke speakers. It's called dapra. It's made from um, buckwheat leaves. So it turns, after you made from, it turns into like a powder, like this, and then we make a stew out of it. Um, while I'm doing the recipe, if you guys lo listen closely, you'll see some of the words that's um, displayed in the back. If you listen for those words, I think you'll get which ingredient is called which one. So just look after that. Okay. So naba daprazu, kuju laze sowa bili. Daprazu, wose powder, matcha powder lema talimang bili. Su kuju laze sowa bili. Naba su um. Give it up, give it up to win. Give it up to the Ozi Sang Bin. Dab to Sang Li Zinze, Kartung Taze, Ozi, Langri Towin, Langri Toze, Ose Towin. So much about the Lima Manga Me. Ose the Zukra Prostitute to the Lazi Tower, Billy Naba, Curie, Shah Dewin. Shah, Shah Dewin. Shah Dize, Ozi, Curie, Dili Zinze, the Tapra Pumbin, Tapra Ti Pumbin. Was it Dapla Pepe? 
kubra kubra puni ti dobla kawen ozi tuli ozi lazi gupin tabla tuti chang na tau ni pungso ozi gupli jumpi da tuli no pungbin Denai, no punje da tisa nen matcha punje. Ma matcha dena sentel, matcha dena punje. Kimi zari matcha se mateli, matcha tha punje. Le hobi nozi kiu tumi mangi. O se lajo rukse da dabra zu taji. तो दाबला जो हमारे केन पे पे सेंट हैं, जागरी आम केन योजे रिंग मिरिंग मिरिंग आंगन, ता योम चाली चाली ता तो इन हमारे केन पे पे सेंट हैं, दाबला जो ता गिमी जाजे चाजी, जंग दी लेवा मुम, वो जो जो लेवा मुझे ही ना, से के मी जाजे देना दाबला जाएं, वो चे so this is Dapra. Where can I find this one? Aside from the green space, where can I <laughs> find a nice hot bowl of Dapra? Uh, just in second home. And uh, where, where's your home? Where do you, where, where? I live in Brooklyn. <laughs> in Brooklyn. Okay. Yeah. So, so Rasmina's place. What next weekend? Yeah. Maybe perhaps. Okay. Okay. <laughs> no. Um, there's so many Nepali restaurants out in, especially in Jackson Heights. Sure. You live in Jackson yeah, Heights. Yeah, I do happen to live in Jackson Heights. Yeah, but there's no way you're gonna find this recipe uh -huh. because it's a traditionally home cooked meal. So this is the kind of thing that you can only find in the few uh, Seke speaking homes, mm -hmm. but it's very much a staple of, yeah. of your people. Okay. It's been eaten for a long time, um, especially. If you, I, I could translate what I said a little bit. It's very easy to make. That's why it's made a lot. Sometimes, especially in New York, when people are coming late from work, yeah, just put on the stove, and 10, 15 minutes after the meat is boiled, it's basically done. And what is the meat? The meat is a goat meat. Okay. Rasha. Okay. Rasha means meat. And the and the and the powder itself. Where, if I'm going to get that, because that's the only ingredient that is, I guess, sort of difficult to locate, right? Yeah, this one too, because this is kupra, but. It's uh, barley flour, but now you can find it. Before, about like 10 years before, when my mom, when my parents came to America first time, this wasn't here. So they used to ship that from my country. <laughs> if you call them, oh, what do you want? We want dabra, we want kubra, that's what they would say. <laughs> but now, um, many people, they've started to make this. So you can find this. Okay. Dabra, you can't find it in any store. You can't? No. Oh, okay, okay, great. All right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. She's got the hook up. All right. Thank you so much, Rasmina. Thank you. All right. So now we are going to have a little language lesson with our next uh, speaker. I guess once we've cleared um, the Dapra for my and later ingestion, I suppose. You put that in the back, in the thermos. <laughs> All right, so we're going to get a little language lesson. Um, so let's call up our next speaker, Alex Paz. All right, so you're going to just tell us about what you're going to do. You're going to do this little course in, in your own language, which is? Uh, okay. So I'm just going to give you uh, some basic readings and uh, teach you some unique things about, about the language. Uh, so I'm going to get started. And if you have more questions, no? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, my name is Alex Pass. Uh, like I said, I'm here to talk to you a little more about uh, you know, once you take this mic, it's better. <laughs> anyway, I, I come from a from a really small town in the mountains of Michoacan. It's a it's a really beautiful place. So it's a tiny town. There's probably only like 
you can walk the town from from one side to another in like 10 minutes <laughs> so <laughs> it's a really small place uh, anyways so Purepecha it's a it's an indigenous language from from Michoacan and uh, as of today it's spoken by uh, by around 40,000 people in Mexico uh, the language is also known as an isolate language, which means that it's not related to, to any other language. Okay, so that makes me feel special. <laughs> uh, and uh, you, know, you know how many speakers we have in New York of uh, this beautiful language? Wow. Oh, now you saw it. <laughs> but yeah, I'm the only speaker in the city. Uh, I haven't found anyone else yet. <laughs> so. So that makes me feel even more special that I'm the only one. But uh, if you find anyone, let me know. Uh, I'm happy to meet that person. But anyways, uh, I forgot what I was going to talk about. So let's see the next slide. All right, so I'm here for, for a brief Purepecha lesson. Uh, even if you didn't want me here, I'm the only one. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, let's see. Uh, this is, well, first. A picture of my town, because I like to show my town, if it, even if it's not that pretty. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, this uh, this uh, picture makes me feel really homesick because uh, uh, I used to spend every day there. Uh, we have the school to the right, the church is right there, and that's the main plaza. So all the festivities happen there, all the school events happen there, all the religious events happen there. So. Uh, most of the days is really quiet, as you can see. So that's why a lot of my friends used to gather here every afternoon to play soccer. But uh, but but yeah, when when there is something going on, it gets it gets fun. <laughs> uh, and that's where I used to buy uh, my fruit <laughs> from that little stand. Anyways, greetings. The first word that we have is hello. Uh, the word is nachos. Uh, sounds, sounds really good, sounds really good. I almost feel like I'm home. Uh, but the thing is that we don't use this word in my hometown. <laughs> uh, that's why it's not like home. <laughs> but, um, but it means hello. I've heard other people use it from different towns. I don't use it. So what we say in our town is nipaya, which means I'm going or I'm passing through here. Okay, um, and it's not really hello, but it's, it's a form of hello because um, um, it's a small town, so it's not nice that you just ignore someone <laughs> and not acknowledge their presence, for instance. But uh, during the afternoon, a lot of people just sit outside, a lot of people coming back from work pass by your house, or they're going to the store. So. What they say when they see you, they say nipaya. So it's almost like telling them, oh, I'm passing through here. Or asking for permission that they're passing or wasting your time for passing through there. And, uh, and, the, and the answer for that is cesarast. Okay? Um, sounds good. Cesarast. Good, good. Uh, anyways, that's, that just means it's good. Go, leave, pass. Uh, you're allowed to pass. All right, the next one is good morning, okay? So, <clears throat> we don't really say good morning. We ask the person, how did you wake up, or did you wake up well? Okay, because uh, we want to make sure that he's fine. <laughs> uh, so, let's try it. Ceci? Erandis. Sounds good, sounds good. Uh, and that response is not just good, all right? So, because you have to ask them how they're feeling too, because uh, you don't want to be that person who doesn't care. <laughs> so, we say, says, katu, says. Good, and. Yes, and that means good. And are you also good? Then you continue talking about whatever you want. But anyways, we're gonna get to something uh, a little more unique about my language and uh, something a, a bit more complicated. 
Okay, so in my in Purepecha, we have like these special suffixes, uh, and they really key to Purepecha because, uh, well, I'm gonna show you why. But these suffixes help describe an action. They help explain where an action is happening, how an action is happening, because uh, in Purepecha, you gotta be like really specific. You gotta give a lot of information of how something is happening. Okay, because uh, we don't want any mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> but we're gonna use this illustration. These suffixes don't only apply to the body. Okay, so they're more like a metaphor for space. Like, for instance, we have words for every part of the body, but because these suffixes have to replace words, uh, well, an example just to, to clarify, because I'm confused too. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> F, F is head, okay? But tree replaces head when you're, uh, when you're talking, okay? So that's gonna replace head in many, many times. Or it's also gonna explain that something is happening on top of something, okay? Then we also have mu, which refers to the mouth, okay? Uh, in the mouth is an entrance, right? So what else is an entrance? A door. a door. Yeah, so when you're talking about like something, that something's happening by the door, you will have to use mu. So that's how it's like space, body. <laughs> so, and they're key because in Purepecha, we use one word to describe the entire action, okay? So for instance, we have uh, this example, which means to kiss one's own hand. Uh, and the word is putihkun, because uh, puti means to kiss, and ku refers to the hand. So kiss one's own hand. But now, if you want to kiss someone else, <laughs> someone else's body part, <laughs> uh, um, like the mouth, like the mouth. <laughs> So that, again, you have to use uh, another suffix, ku, but this is a ku without the, the apostrophe. <coughs> With, this is just to refer to someone else's body part, okay? So to kiss someone's mouth would be puti, to kiss, mu, mouth, ku, someone else, that's how it works, puti, mu, ku. So you can see we're really specific with what we want, where, where we want it, how we want it. <laughs> uh, and this is just to show a little about the complexity of the language, okay? So here's the example. <coughs> we have how many words in English? One, two, three, four, how many? I can't see. <laughs> Eight, eight words, okay? But in Purepecha, we only have one word to describe that entire action. So, puti, to kiss again. Ngari, that's on the face. Uh, ku, someone else. Nta, that's again. Uh, and the rest is just a tense maker, okay? Um, any questions? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, putting <laughs> so, so yeah, sounds, sounds nice. <laughs> uh, so anyways, uh, so I hope you guys enjoyed the lesson. It was really short, but <laughs> thank you, Alex. This is like the first, um, it's like the first like adults only language class I've ever been to. <laughs> Feel like provocative and very after hours kind of a feeling here. So, but I feel like, you know, the whole thing about like, you know, how did you wake up and all, it doesn't feel especially New York-y. I'm wondering if you have any things that you say when you're shouting at somebody on the street in New York. I don't really shout. I'm a, as you can see from my, from my culture, I'm a really calm person. You're a romantic, I mean. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What can I say? <laughs> And so when you are speaking, 
Are you speaking mostly with people back home since you don't have any fellow um, Puerto Pecha speakers here in New York? Every now and then, whenever my mom, my mom feels like calling me, she, she doesn't really call me often, but <laughs> every now and then, whenever she, she does, uh, I try to practice a little. And like I said, uh, I'm practicing a lot at, at Endangered Language Alliance because before I came, I came to New York, I, I knew how to speak the language, but I didn't really understand, or I couldn't really ex explain how the language works. So now, now I understand more, and, uh, and we're gonna start uh, with some Purepecha lessons online, hopefully in the upcoming weeks. So, so I'm excited to, to teach others and see how it goes. <laughs> Thank you, Alex Paz. And thanks to the ELA for making this possible. All right, so we've got one more segment left before we close up the night, and that's going to be, I figure now that you all are plenty literary, we're just going to go with a little easy entertainment. Um, so we're going to bring out two performers. Um, uh, so please welcome our uh, closing act, uh, Saleo Suso and Kawile Kamara. So Kawile, Kranko is a Mande language, the language of the ancient Mande empire that you know as the ancient Mali empire. So Kranko is a small part of that. So when you start to tell a story, right? Yep. You don't just say, I'm going to tell a story. You have a song. We have a song for everything. So you start off with a song. So what you've just heard me say is that I have come amongst you. I am thundering like a straw of thunder, telling you what a storyteller is like. So, they say, Rankole de Barnati Salankuma Panconyar Lon, say Rankole de Barnati Salankuma Panconyar Lon, they say Rankole de Barnati Salankuma Panconyar Lon. They say, until they, until they, you say, ah, oh. until they. Ah. Alabara Hera Kurake, Kabo Gambia, Alabara Hera Kurake, Mamadou Salio Suso, Alabara Hera Kurake, Kabo Serra Lyon, Alabara Hera Kurake, Kaulen Kamara, Alabara Hera K
Cabo Europe. Cabo South America. Cabo Asia. Emanye. Cabo a fight between a brother and a sister, what do you do? You call the storyteller. Yeah? You call the story. You call the story. You know? Go on, go on, go on. The jelly, the final. You get it? When the husband and the wife are really having it up, you know, it's like, okay, time to call what? The jelly and the final. So this is the tradition that we are coming from. Storytelling is so dear to us. What Charlie you sister is playing? A four. come from, wherever, what part of the world you come from, Gambia, Sierra Leone, Asia, Latin America, God has given you a good new beginning, right here, right now. 
good new beginning coming from everywhere. Now here is one song we sing for you that happened to be in our little village that we sing. Tell them a little story a little bit before you yeah. play the song. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The story is called Kom Doma Do Long. Do Long. Say, Do Ka Do Long. Do Ka Do Long. Can you say that? Do Ka Do Long. Do Ka Do Long. Do Ka Do Long. You say, Do Ma O Long. Do Ma O Long. Can you say that? Do Ma O Long. Do Ma O Long. Do Ka Do Long. Do Ma O Long. Do Ma O Long. Do ka do long, do ka do long, do ma wo long, do ma wo long, do ka do long, do ka do long, do ma wo long, do ma wo long. Okay, ma wo. Awa, anya fe. You get it, right? we are but at the same time how valuable we are to each other in our little village there was a big competition and Pastor Suso told me the story there was a big competition they gathered all the people they wanted to have the artists the people that come and play so they had everybody coming from all over the place they were coming to play some can play the chorus man so play the chorus and everybody says oh man this this guy is the best Forget about it. Forget about it. Let's just close it. No competition. This is the best. Mm -hmm. No? And then another person comes. He says, well, I, I dance. I tell a story with my feet. And she dances, man. OK? And when she danced, you know, I mean, time just went on. People didn't realize. Before they know, the cocks were already crowing <laughs> in the morning. Because she was so good. They said, oh, she's the best artist in the world. Forget about it. Another person comes. Another person comes. Another person comes. And finally, this one guy comes. And they say, what do you have to say to people after all these great artists have come before you? The dancers, the singers, you know, every kind of artist. He says, well, I have something to say. I have something. 
He said, so what do you, what do you, can you do? He said, what? Do ka do long, do ma o long, do ka do fa, do ma fa, do ka do che, do ma long. And the kids started saying, look at this guy. What did he not say? Have anything to say? He doesn't have any song, nothing, not, not singing, do ka do long, do ma o long. All, after all these great people have come, say, do ka do long, do ma o long. Then before you know, everybody starts saying, what? Do ka do long, do ma o long, do ka do fa, do ma fa, do ka do che, do ma che, do ka do long. So the elders, as you know how it is, decided that the artist amongst you, amongst us, is the one that understands. Some know some things, some don't know. Some say some things, some don't say. Some do some things, some don't do. Look at the law, do more law. So how are we on time? Huh? We have some time? Yeah. Okay, well, what do you want to do? <laughs> want to give them Lamba? Lamba? Yeah, let's do it. Yeah. Let's give them Lamba. Say, 
creator of the heavens and the earth, the one that created the universe, creator of all creators, created nobility, humility, that same creator created, they tell us, the universe out of his very words, the very words of the creator. I say his, I'm sorry folks, in my language you don't have his or she or something, you don't have that in my language. You know, we, you know, we don't have gender in our language. So if you hear me say, he created, she created, I'm just... <laughs> Anyway, that force created language, the beauty of language, the power of language. And we, storytellers, our tradition is to tell the stories. And we say, Jelia, to be an artist, to be a poet, to be whatever we call Jelia, Fina, it's a calling. It cannot be undermined. It's powerful. It cannot be undermined. It's serious business. Because words, words do not die. Words do not rust. Words, serious business. Eh? Words do not die. Words do not rust. I have heard great men and women leave this earth. They walked all over the world. They conquered everywhere. And where are they today? They are taken by the earth. But words, words do not die. Words do not rust. So Jelia, this is song. Lambang is a song to that word. So Jenny, a four. Galia, Galia, everybody, Galia, 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 Kobaye, Galia, Kobaye, Galia, Kobaye, Galia, Galia. So they are still shuttle. Give me that camera. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you to all the performers tonight. And thank you, Language Wyatt. And thanks to all of you for showing up and giving a place for the beauty of language in this amazing city. My neighbor right here, Jackson Heights neighbor. All great things are from Jackson Heights. All right. All right. Good night, everybody. Thank you so much. <laughs>